special guest on the show tonight, and I'm really honored that he could spare us uh, some time out of his uh, very busy schedule. He's an expert on the flat earth theory and has written a number of books on the subject, which are available on Amazon. He also runs a YouTube channel called Flat Earth Clues, which at the time of writing this has amassed over 10 million views and has almost 100,000 subscribers, which is very impressive. He's also the subject of a Netflix documentary titled Behind the Curve, which, by the way, is, is a fantastic watch. And if you get the opportunity, I highly recommend that you check that out. His name is Mark Sargent, and he's joining us from his home in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. Mark, hello. How are you doing? I am doing very well. How are you? I'm I'm well. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for coming on the show. Um, I appreciate it. it was quite short notice for you, um, but we really appreciate you coming on. Ha happy to do it. Happy to do it. Okay, so um, obviously we want to talk about um, uh, the flat Earth theory, something that um, uh, you're, um, I believe, as the LA Times uh, called it, you're the main organizer for the flat Earth movement. Um, so I just wanted to discuss, in a nutshell, um, with you. You, you essentially hold genuine firm belief that the Earth is flat and that all the evidence to the contrary is false. Is that correct? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, yeah, that is true. And not, not this, not, it's not just flat, it's also enclosed. You're living in a box, uh, a giant building, a planetarium, a terrarium that is so old and so large that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out till almost 1960. And that would be the Americans in the Soviet Union at the time. And when they did, they decided to keep it under wraps. And by that, I mean a building with inside that building is a giant saltwater lake. And in that lake are a bunch of islands, which we know as the continents. And the only thing that doesn't look exactly, well, more or less like the continent layout that we, that we know now, you know, the shapes and sizes of the continents would be Antarctica. So Antarctica isn't this uh, island nation that lives, you know, that... Um, that's about the same size and, and as uh, Australia, it is st stretched out around the entire outer boundaries and is the beginning of the end. So the Antarctic coastline wouldn't be the edge of Earth. It's not like Asgard. It's not like a cosmic waterfall thing. But that's the starting of it. And once you went in thousands of miles, eventually you would run into some sort of barrier. So yes, that's what I believe. And, and yes, to, to make it even more clear, no, I do not think we are this tiny little rock covered with a little bit of water and even a smaller amount of smoke or gas inside this vast, massive, impossible universe. I think it's very contained and very structured. Okay, interesting. Um, so you mentioned about the um, the Antarctic um, around the, if I'm correct, the the the, the rim of the um, yeah. of, uh, of the base of what we're on. So is that to assume that there's some kind of um, uh, to to coin a reference from Game of Thrones, I guess, some kind of ice wall or something like that to contain well, water from spilling over? Yeah, I guess? yeah, yeah. So the the uh, to use one of my uh, my peers when they say, oh, you know, why is the water fall off? You know, we mm -hmm. hear that a lot. You know, it's the standard, and it's like, okay, I get it. The old Old illustrations of the water falling off because because people can't get, escape that because they keep thinking of space that's the big thing i'm saying look you're in a building that's probably sitting on somebody's desk <laughs> right now right. but the question is why doesn't the water fall off it's like, okay why doesn't a water fall off in a lake it's because it's got a shoreline all the way around it um so there is there is a wall i mean the antarctic coastline is mostly a sheer wall of ice that's only a couple hundred feet high but what's more interesting about antarctica and the general public doesn't know this is that antarctica slopes up very very quickly and most of the continent even by mainstream standards sits at about fourteen thousand feet making it really unusual compared to every other land mass we have. you got to remember, altitude sickness kicks in at about 7,000 feet. And mm -hmm. most of this continent, it's like about 14,000, and some are even higher. Nah, it's the whole place just screams go away. Okay, so um, so I guess, um, I guess my next question then is, at what point did you start believing in this theory, and what convinced you of it being um, the... The, the the correct way the, the the way things actually are as opposed to the 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 narrative that the the science community rolls oh yeah yeah it was um i got into it initially in 2014 when i because i never got married or had kids and i'm older you know i'm in my early 50s now and because of that if you don't ever get married or have kids you have a lot of free time on your hands and because i was older i was also there when the internet was just firing up and and you know the conspiracy world and the truth or community was was getting going and so i had plenty of time to look at just about every conspiracy you could think of 
And I have an opinion on just about every conspiracy you can think of. I, some I like, some I don't. I, I try to keep it as positive as, as possible. And my qualifier, just, just so you know, for any conspiracy is could I improve on it? Meaning I don't look at the conspiracies like, oh, this is evil and sinister and the Illuminati must be stopped. Nothing like that. I say is, okay, why are they doing it? And I believe in the greater good, always have, which is if the ends justify sometimes horrible means, does that make sense? And if it does, then it's like, oh, yeah, it's probably real then because, you know, people in power tend to be of the moral flexibility type. Anyway, so I got into this uh, after looking through all these different conspiracies. The beginning uh, in the middle of 2014, I was looking into Hollow Earth because I'd never looked into it. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Got tied, me tied into uh, Admiral Byrd, Richard Byrd, the youngest admiral in the United States Navy, who was the first guy to fly his own plane around the North Pole. And then for whatever reason, that whole storyline changed and the military sent him down to Antarctica and he flew basically nonstop missions for the next 30 years, from 1928 up until his death in 1957, I believe. And the, it, was, it was just incredible. So what, what got me was, you know, what flipped me was, the, was Antarctica in terms of the treaty. Because every other treaty, I don't, I don't care what country you're in, has been broken over time, with the exception of one. And that's the Antarctic Treaty. I mean, treaty is meant to be broken. This one, not only has it never been broken, it's never been challenged. And you can look it up. The PDF is online. It's been on there. It was first ratified, I believe, in 1959. And all the nations that were down there had to sign on to it. And it basically said, no corporation from any country can set up shop there forever. <laughs> and that just threw up huge red flags for me. I'm a student of history. And it's like, look, this world is built, especially in the capitalist you know, countries, it's built on money and greed and power. Plain and simple. When Admiral Byrd went on television, national television here, and he said that the entire uh, uh, Antarctica is made out of money, right? There's a mountain range made out of coal and there's uranium and there's go oil and gas reserves and all this stuff. And we're going to be fighting over disputing this for the next hundred years. And then a couple years later, they said they start working on paperwork saying, yeah, nobody should ever go down there ever. Uh, let's not talk about it. What blew me away was not that uh, the corporations can't go down there, but they can't even talk about it. So British Petroleum, for example, wanted to uh, run full page ads in the London Times you know, back in the day and say how great it would be for us to expand our energy empire and do this. No, they, they never did it. You Somewhere along the line, the, the higher ups were, talked to the you know, presidents of these companies and, and made them sign non-disclosure agreements and said, oh, yeah, no one could go down there. It's national security. You're not even allowed to talk about it. That's it. Have a nice day. And that's huge. I mean, anyone in the truth community is like, look, there are very few issues that are bigger than money. I mean, money is a, was an old movie line. Nine out of 10 problems in the world revolve around money. This is one of those things that's so big. They said, you know what? The trillions of dollars in resources, not even, not even on the table anymore. And so that was, that was the big thing that flipped me that, then that there was something being hidden uh, that was tied into, you know, the world being uh, a big and closed system. There you go. Interesting. No, brilliant. Thank you. Um, can I ask where, um, where is your background? I understand that you, uh, or you either currently or previously worked professionally as a software analyst. Is that correct? I, I started out, believe it or not, playing video games for a living back okay. in the, yeah, back in the day. Uh, I won a little video game tournament back in 94 and parlayed that into a software gig where I was, uh, <laughs> I was a ringer, first of all, for, for this gaming company out in Colorado and went around to all the conventions and, and then I became a game producer for the same company where I was recruiting guys, the, you know, software developers and graphic artists and music guys and, and putting them all together. And that, that was a lot of fun. And then the video game industry started changing, started getting really, really big, and this company just couldn't keep up. So I jumped over to time and attendance software. And if you want to call it a software analyst, that's fine. I was mostly in high-level support. I was doing a lot of beta testing um, and, and not, not engineering, but I was doing sales engineering. 
So I would go, I would work with the sales guys and, you know, cause they want to sell the software a certain way, but time and attendance software, which is basically timekeeping software is so broad and so, so complex potentially that what really helped me was I had to take this really, really broad software package and I had to boil it down for every company that I went to. I, I traveled around the country and sometimes outside the country and installed in blue collar factory environments, these time clock systems, and I would train the people on, on how to use them. And I would, I was basically, I got very good at boiling down complex things into what you should know, the lowest common denominator. And I did that over a number of years and it was, it, it just, it's how I think now to where I, you know, I can look it up. I look at just about any, any subject and I say, okay, stop making it too complex. What is the, what is the basic, basic thing? So when, like, for example, the, the flat earth, I, yeah, the, the flat earth is the, just the term that's, that's the lowest you know denominator I can bring out there. Most of the time I love to tell people, it's like, look, it's probably virtual. If it's flat and it's enclosed, it's probably digital. You know, the the whole matrix 13th floor thing, that's what I really believe in, but the, the general public can't grasp that. Um, you know, the matrix is what, 22 years old now? And most of the people didn't get it. It's like, oh yeah, they, they got the special effects and a cool storyline and very, very, very slick, but they didn't understand the concept. Uh, or the 13th floor, which was based on a, um, a 70s movie from Germany, uh, called World on a Wire, which was based on a 60s book called uh, Simulcron 3. You know, Simulcron Simulation. Anyway, sorry, I'm going off into the weeds here. No, no, no problem. <laughs> um, the reason why I ask about your background is because clearly you're you're an educated um, gentleman. Um, mm. And also um, to tie that into the documentary that I mentioned on Netflix, there was also some other um, individuals on there. Like I think there was an astrophysicist from Caltech um, interviewed yep. in the sim documentary and so on. So yep. there's clearly individuals with an educated background that, 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 that believe in this theory. Whereas I think the general perception is is you know w without trying to sound insulting is that you know people who believe in, in in the flat earth movement might not necessarily be um that intelligent so to speak right. how do you feel when when individuals kind of say that oh no i don't i, I the, in fact i i have been known to say many many times if you don't laugh at this thing in the first 20 minutes there's probably something wrong with you uh flat earth the conditioning for people everybody is so strict and so deep that your your reaction has to be, you know, you have, you know, the, the five stages of acceptance, you know, denial, anger, um, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. The first the first instinct is always denial. Every including me. It was like, no, there's no way. There's no freaking way. Why? Well, because that's what we were told. Which is why I love the um the wonderful George Orwell quote from uh, 1946, I believe, where in fact, you know what, do I have that line around here? I think I do. Let me read it verbatim, which is, um, he said, it was written uh, 1946 uh, in the Tribune, number 27. Uh, most people, if and he was not a flat earther, by the way, most people, if asked to prove that the earth is round, would not even bother to produce the rather weak arguments I've outlined above. They would start off by saying that everyone knows the earth to be round, and if pressed further, would become angry. In a way, Shaw is right. This is a credulous age, and the burden of knowledge which we now have to carry is partly responsible. And what he was saying is, is that science gets away with murder now. Basically, if you wear a lab coat and you have any sort of credentials at all, you can say whatever you want, and the general public's going to believe you. And they'll say, it's like, well, this person obviously know more, knows more than me, therefore I should believe him. The bigger question was, in 1946, how did everybody know the world was a globe? How did everybody know? The NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. There were no space missions, not even close. So how did everybody know? And when you put it to them, there's this, the wheels start grinding in the average person, which is, it's, it's not that they know, it's they've been told. And there's very different things there, which is why I put out the challenge to people. I say, look, if you think you see, I have had so many people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have told me, I've seen, I've seen the curve from an airplane. Okay, great, fine, take a picture of it. Put it up, take a picture of it. Put it on your laptop or your screen or whatever and hold a straight edge and tell me if that curve's still there. If it is, send it to me. I will quit Flat Earth tomorrow. No one has sent me anything. Now, of course, I've never gotten any apologies e emails either, but that's okay. Again, it's not that they see it. And again, this is straight out of Orwell, which is it's not that they see it. They want to see it. Again, very, very different things. It's five lights, four lights. You are told there's a curve over and over and over and over and over again since you were six years old. 
And then, uh, so when, what happens? You know, when somebody challenges that, it's like, well, it's a curve. In fact, in our country, for example, I can't speak for you guys, which is, you know, we have the American flag in the corner of every classroom. And if you make it from kindergarten to graduation, just high school graduation, you, I mean, there are people that join the military partially because they see that, that flag up in the corner. Well, right below that flag in most classrooms is the globe. But what's the difference? Right. You know, look up at the flag. It's like, oh, that's where I live. Right. You look down the globe. It's like, oh, that's where I live. Well, the problem is, is that the flag that actually represents a country you're actually in the globe. That's just a little toy model that nobody's ever seen, you know, not from space. Anyway, there you go. So obviously you think that uh, I, I when I when I say science, I mean, the accepted science narrative, um, yeah. and, you know, all those that purport the, the global earth theory, um, mm -hmm. you, you say that's part of a conspiracy in that case. So yeah. what do you think the aims of that conspiracy are and, and who's involved in that conspiracy? Uh, like any conspiracy, most of it's around control and power. Uh, you know, information is the most powerful thing there is, is out there. Forget about money and other resources. It's information. If you know the outcome, I mean, look at the, um, the, the wonderful Roth, Rothschild story about how they knew what the, the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo was, for example, before the, the British government did. And because of that, the, you know, the stock market, you know, they spread the rumor, the stock market crashed, then the real information, it's like, oh, no, the British actually won. <laughs> and then it's like, but they had cornered the market at that point. They had bought all the stocks when they were really, really low. So when we're talking about power here, think about this, because people have asked me, um, in fact, what was the most famous one? I'll drop a name for you. Um, uh, Piers Morgan asked me that very question. And he says, uh, you know, he goes, why, why keep it a secret? Why, why not tell people? And I go, and I asked him, I go, really? W would you break this story? Would you tell people? And think about that for a second. Because the ramifications, by the time you figure it out. Now, if telling people hundreds of years ago, that's one thing. You can mold society and civilization to your liking. But if you don't even know as a, as, we'll just call them the Illuminati, right? I'm, I'm, there's so many different groups. I'm not going to say who's at the top of the food chain. I don't know. But. If you're in a big Illuminati meeting and in 1960, when civilization has already been built, you know, the cement has hardened, the paint has dried, do you tell the general public? Do you release it to the general public, given that this is some of the most valuable, if not the most valuable piece of information in our history? Well, somebody says at the end of the table, well, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> Three things could go wrong, and they're disastrous, which is first off, the academic world would be in utter upheaval for decades. You know, think about it. Astrophysics and astronomy, they're gone pretty much forever. You have to rename them. You don't even know what to do with those. And the remaining physical sciences, uh, geology, hydrology, archaeology, biology, though, anything with an ology has to be rebuilt. Libraries have to be emptied. It's just chaos. And that's every university in every country. That's a lot of academia. Uh, economics, the world markets have to close for months. Because you don't know what it means. You know, the, the ramifications there are huge. But the big one, the really, really big one, the dangerous one is uh, the religious aspect. Because you're, you're giving the five major religious houses of this world, um, Judaism, Buddhism, um, Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity, you're giving them all uh, leverage against science and you're asking them to show restraint against science, even though science has been beating them over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries. And you, that, they would never, that would not go well because those people would then turn on science and say, okay, you were really wrong about something important. What else were you wrong about? Let's revisit some things like, I don't know, evolution, carbon dating, the big bang theory, dark matter. I don't know, anything that we, we see in your books, science would never recover. Between those three things, that's one of the shortest Illuminati meetings ever. <laughs> They're like, it's like, you know, you just say, what could go wrong? And then you, somebody rattles off that stuff. It's like, okay. We're not going to tell anybody until we can figure out how to best use it to our benefit. And they held on to the secret, you know, since about 1960. And for whatever reason, they're allowing this to get out now. And I mean, what I mean allowing is our community was running pretty much unchecked for three years and change from 2015 to 2018. We were getting promoted by all the big tech. We we're getting promoted by all these different things. You know, every major YouTube channel has done a flat earth video at some point because they saw the metrics. It's like, holy smokes, you do a flat earth video, not only do your hits double, but your comment section goes up like a thousand percent because people are so polarized about it. So something's, I don't know why we're being allowed to do this. There's something else coming though. 
you know, who knows? Maybe we're in the middle of it right now. But uh, flat Earth seems to be a, the picture frame for for a much much bigger canvas. There you Have go. you ever been um, kind of challenged? Um, kind of, I, I guess to use the phrase forcefully is probably the, the the wrong word. By 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 people in authority, I guess. Have you ever been kind of? Told- oh, you mean like. <laughs> yeah, the the question, which is, um, have I ever been? Has anyone ever reached out to me with either the carrot or the stick? I think is what sure. you're getting. Absolutely. Uh, no, and but th- that doesn't help me most of the time because people think, oh, Mark's getting away with it because you know I've been called a government agent a number of times because I don't get challenged. But at the same time, it's like, nah, it's not what you might think because I also put myself in a position where you can't really, there's not much you can do in the way of leverage. What are you going to do? I mean, I never got married and never had kids. Uh, my circle of friends is in the community. So, and this is what I do um, for a living, at least until the pandemic happened, is what I was doing. So there's no, no one's ever, no black cars ever followed me. Um, no one's ever approached me with a briefcase, you know, two briefcases, usually um, a pile of money in one and a gun in the other to make the point. Kind of like what they did with Joe Rogan, which was, you know, Joe, Joe was a great example of, of what could happen, which was, uh, you know, the, he was beating the crap out of NASA on a regular basis and he was not a flat earther. And then all of a sudden he was winning and he goes dark for like a year and when he comes back uh he had a brand new show uh, at least a one-year contract on science channel called um uh joe rogan questions everything and the very first episode he apologized publicly for everything bad he ever said about nasa not suspicious at all for our community standpoint and then he gets the the biggest podcast in the world after that after the the show ran out i was like okay uh, but but he's been known i mean you know the, um what was it alex jones even said during one of um uh, one of his little off-camera things where he's going because he, he's good friends with Joe Rogan. And he said, "Oh yeah, they they got to him. You know, they they you know because again they will usually use the carrot and the stick simultaneously. They'll say you take the money, you'll live the good life. But if you don't take the money, we'll ruin you, and uh, or do do horrible things. Anyway, there you go. Sorry, long-winded answer. No, oh, no, that was great. Thank you. Um, you you mentioned about um your circle of friends all being in the in 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 the movement. Do you yeah. think there would ever be anyone that you could be friends with who who didn't believe um uh in in the flat earth or is that kind oh, of a sure. Pre- no 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 sure oh yeah 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 I've got oh yeah I've got lots of friends that aren't in the community, but mm-hmm. my closest friends are in it because you know, that's this is what I've been doing for six years. You know, we between the conventions uh, and the meetups and all the online things we've done over and over. It's a very, very tight community. We're always knowing what's going on and and always keeping track of each other because we're we're very information hungry. We're always trying to figure out what you know. It started out with okay, what new things are people doing? What new experiments? What new uh, discoveries in, you know, in, in different places? So we're always like, okay, is it you know what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? So because of that, you know, the, the group is, is pretty much, I, I know, you know, like I tell people, like if, if anyone needs to get a hold of somebody in our community, if I don't know how to track them down immediately, I definitely know someone who does. Okay. Um, just to take a step back a little bit to what you said um, early on in our conversation, it's a bit of an existentialist um, question, this. Um, yeah. Obviously, you mentioned that um, we live on a uh, flat disk that is that is enclosed in, in um, I guess, a dome, for lack of a better phrase. Sure. Um, so what do you think, then, is outside that dome? Um, and do you think that we are some kind of experiment? Are we controlled? Who who are the creators? Do you have any of that information? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question and I love answering it, which is it can only be one of two things. Either, because again, why the religious angle, why, you know, why 50%, by the way, of our membership are, are, at least in the United States, are strong Christians. Because if it was built, if you're living in basically a snow globe, then it was built by someone which means it was created by someone. At that point, okay, it's, well, you, you fork off into one of two places, which is either uh, an older civilization, which is more powerful than, and more advanced than ourselves, or the divine. And really, then you're kind of splitting hairs, aren't you? Because really, one man's advanced tech is another man's deity. So that is, that's as far as go, you know, who built it. As far as what's outside this place, I like to think of it as 
the opposite of what's in this place. This world, if you if you stare at it long enough, and get part of my software background, you stare at something long, long enough, you will start to see patterns, uh, especially the, the subtle nuances is what I love, which is this world is 99.99% conflict. It is practically inescapable, meaning it doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are, there is always something in conflict. There is always something to complain about. I, you know, everyone tries to strike. It's like, oh, you know, your role models are all these people <laughs> that at this high level. It's like, no, they've got serious problems. Uh, you know, I, there, there was a wonderful um, story from years and years ago. Um, one of our um, early, early millionaires, uh, was it um, uh, Getty back in the back in the day in America? And he had this like 110 room mansion, for example, you know, just a little place. And <laughs> He ripped out all the phones in the mansion because the guests kept making long distance calls <laughs> and he replaced them with pay phones in the hallways. Right. It's like, you know, the guy has more money than than a than a, uh, a pharaoh. And <laughs> that's what he thinks about. Right. But, but my point, you, you kind of get it. Right. So if this world is ninety nine point nine nine percent conflict and what's outside of here has to be ninety nine point nine percent unlimited and which also would mean it'd be potentially cyclical. Um, the if you want to get in the existential ex, sorry, existential side of things, uh, I use the uh, the genie and the million wishes story, which uh, I came up with years ago. Which was okay. Uh, a genie comes to you. You rub, you know, you rub the lamp. You get three wishes, and, but you're smart, so you think, "Oh, one of my wishes is going to be a million wishes." Don't ever do that because you'll never make it. And you start wishing for stuff. And you go through all these things. You know, most people in general public always wishes for money first. It's like, no, no, go for immortality, perfect health, superpowers, whatever you want. Don't wish for money first. Anyway, you go through all your wishes, and you start running out of things to wish for, right? To where, I mean, you, you, you've been the rock star, you've dated everyone you ever wanted, dated, you become the, you know, whatever you wanted to become, and you run out of days. I, I believe on a side note that the part of this universe runs off of novelty. And meaning what's new. It's one of the things we always say, right? When we bump into each other, what's new? And we, we thrive on it. We, we just start going crazy if we don't get novelty. And I think that's the same no matter where you go. So anyway, you run through all these wishes, at the end, you come back to the genie. The genie's kind of looking at you, smirking. And he's like, you're out of ideas, aren't you? It's like, yeah, man, I am totally out of ideas. I've, I've been living for, what, 10,000 years. Done all these things. And, and it's like, can you help me out? He's like, well, yeah, yeah, I can, I can do something for you. He goes, um, I got this place you can go to. Limited lifespan, a million ways to die, lots of suffering. You're going to hate it. <laughs> However, and it's like, why would I want to go there? It's like, because when you go there, once you leave and come back, you'll, it'll, this place will be brand new again. And, and you can, you can do this. It's a refresh more than anything. It'll change your perspective. It'll give you more appreciation for where you are. And, 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 and you look and it's like, wow, it sounds pretty great. What's the catch? You know, the catch is you're never going to remember we had this conversation and he snaps his fingers. Voila, you're here. There you go. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> when we talk about a snow globe, um, I think I remember. I think it was in the documentary that I saw it. There was, um, um, I think, one of your one of your colleagues in the flat Earth movement had um, like a model of the the flat Earth disc with the sun and the moon kind of rotating within that dome. Right. Um, so that I can understand. Um, what. Um, what would you say then if I asked how you could explain things like um, other planets, galaxies, that kind of thing? How does that come into it? Oh, um, just lights and lights in the sky. But before I answer that, uh, let me say that the all the illustrations that show the snow globe with the sun and the moon overhead, they are exaggerated. Um, the problem with it, because of the fall, uh, the question I thought you were initially going to ask, is like, how do we have time zones if the sun is get, showing, shining light all the time? It's because when they draw the sun, because they have to make it show up in the illustration, they have to draw it about a couple thousand miles wide. Or we say, no, no, the sun is just a freaking pinpoint. It's like 50 miles wide. Very, very, very small. And same with the moon, which is why they're identical, you know, why the moon fits in front of the sun. Um, but as far as everything else in the sky, it's no different than a planetarium. And I know that dates me. Hardly anyone knows or goes to a planetarium anymore. But when you go to a planetarium, I have gone, and you look up, it's like, oh, look, 
it's Jupiter, right? And it's moons, right? It looks wonderful. And is can you land on it? No. Why not? Well, it's just some light on the ceiling. It looks pretty realistic, but it's still a light on the ceiling. Question is, when you walk out of that building, who's to say you're not in a much, much bigger building? Now, take that perspective and then imagine you bring in, I don't know, an Amish person that has have no exposure, even more than Amish, right? Maybe even person, an old Amish, someone from the 1800s. We'll go back in time for a little bit. And you take them to that same planetarium, you'll blow their minds. Because they're looking up the sky, it's like, how do you get the moon to move so fast? And wow, it's just all these different things. They don't know because they, they've never seen anything like it. You know, we're just kind of used to it because of our the level of our technology. But we're kind of getting to that point now, especially with virtual stuff, that we can create stuff in the sky. It's very, very, very realistic. Um, but who's to say that the, the, the beans or whatever you want to call it that built this place uh, didn't have access to technology. Imagine what we could do if we didn't kill each other and lived, you know, another thousand years as a civilization. What what could we come up with? So where does where does NASA come into all this thing? Because I understand yeah. that, um, <laughs> oh, I understand that your your views on NASA are not very positive. But um, well, well, where, I don't. They... No, no, no. It's it's not that I hate them, but I don't because I don't blame them for what they did. They did what they okay. had. To. Remember, remember the greater good that I, that I mentioned earlier. Yes. NASA did what they had to do because they had to do it. And I probably would have done the same thing. So if you figure out in 1955, 56, during Operation Deep Freeze, that the world is indeed a snow globe, what do you do? Well, it's like, okay, we gotta figure out the boundaries of this place for one. Uh, and we, we got to figure out the dimensions of it. And the second thing we got to do is we have to militarize space. We can't let private companies go up there and just start mucking about because once they do, eventually they're going to start crashing into things and we're not going to be able to explain it. You have to control the information. So faking a space program, brilliant, absolutely brilliant idea. And, and I, and I applaud them for doing it. The way they did it uh, wasn't great. It started out fairly small. You know, NASA was founded in 1958. But they did two things. They announced the Van Allen radiation belts in 1959, which said that, oh, yeah, there's these super, super thick, huge, horrible belts of radiation. You'll kill anyone that goes through it. That that didn't go well. That was a, that was poorly timed. And then at the, in the same year is when the Antarctic Treaty was put in place. So coincidentally, you lock down the outer rim and put a big warning sign on the on the upper part. And that 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 solves two of your big problems right there, which is, OK, well, no one's going to go to Antarctica anyway because it's such a hostile environment. It just, again, screams go away. I think that was part of the design of this place. But then you start creating this you, the, the, the thought between the thought about the space race was you create a fake space race. And then you make it seem like it's so boring and there's nothing else to see that you just shut the whole thing down a few years later, which is what they did. Don't forget, the, the, the Americans supposedly went like, what, six times back, back and forth to the moon. And then 1972, he said, well, nobody cares anymore. And let's, let's just pack it up. Good night, everybody. Roll credits. And that was it. Nobody ever went back again. And it, you know the Soviets. Remember, it was supposed to be a space race. I've never seen that, by the way, in the in the history of anything, where you know the, these two rivals and and the United States gets there first, and the the Soviet Union just walks off the field. As in, it's like no, they would have gone there. They would have put up a small base, and we would have put up a bigger base, and then eventually Time Magazine would have said, "Has the Cold War reached the moon?" That's how it would have gone. But no, the Soviet Union just quietly faded off into nothing in in terms of the the space stuff it was just staggering to me and then all the, any other country nobody nobody decided to go back i remember having a discussion i was over there a couple of years ago um in your neck of the woods and i was talking to uh some science people in um, belfast and i said and and i asked them i you know i said so you know the americans went to you know went to the moon in 1972 i go when are we going back anyone doesn't matter if these americans or not and this, this woman looked at me with the most sincere eyes, and she had to be half my age. And she goes, soon. We're, we're, we're going back soon. And I go, yeah, you see, you've been telling the, the science community this for a long, long time now. I, there's a compilation out there. Every president on our side, from Reagan, right, all the way through to, um, you know, past Trump. Biden doesn't talk about it. Um, 
they've all said the same thing. We're we're committed to going back to the moon. And they just keep kicking that can down and kicking that can down. Can, nothing ever happens. The only thing they got is the uh, the space station and the production value inside that space station is horrifyingly bad. Horrible. It's just, it's just the, the mistakes they made, uh, even a, a C-list director in Hollywood would never, ever make. And I don't know who they're hiring, but they should all be fired. Sorry, there's my little rant. Yeah, I was just I was just about to ask actually regarding um, production values and things like that. So obviously NASA has released photographs of the the Earth from space, uh, the Earth from Moon, and you know various other things. Um, so am I to assume that that is well mainly where the budget goes into faking those kind of photographs and videos? Well, they spend a lot of their money on other stuff because their budget is fifty. I think as of this year, it's fifty four, fifty five million dollars a day. I uh, I don't know what they're spending the, that sort of cash on, but it's not it's not the faking stuff. As a matter of fact, the the blue marble shot, which you speak of, again, the general public, you just they just gloss over things, and general public doesn't know. Especially Americans, we don't know anything when we graduate from high school. So especially nothing about engineering or physics or chemistry or biology. But when it comes to the, the blue marble shot, you could look this up. I I this will this will tell you how. I couldn't even see the forest for the trees back in the day. In 2000, when I was running a tech support team on Boulder, Colorado for the time and attendance thing, I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool if I put different shots of the earth. I was a huge science nerd. Um, put different shots of the earth on every monitor, right? And and I, have, I had world maps and I had globes. I used to collect antique globes. Not kidding you. It makes me like, wow, you're a really interesting and same time boring person. But it's true. I, I I was doing this. And so I was looking online for different pictures of the Earth from space, doing all sorts of Boolean searches on it. There was only one image that was coming up time and time and time again. That was the Apollo 17 blue marble shot. It was the only image out there. In fact, I remember looking, you know, these Internet searches and I just had screen after screen of nothing but this image and different resolutions. and The tint was bad. And I, I remember telling you, yelling at the computer, I go, NASA, you suck. It's like, what the hell is wrong with you guys? It's like, release some more pictures, right? In fact, uh, Al Gore, one of our vice presidents, did the same thing. Called him up. It's like, look, do you have any? He goes, I want a, a globe for the my back wall in my office. Do you have any newer shots? No, we don't. So <clears throat> 1972 was the first blue marble shot ever taken. You know when the second one was taken? 2015. Summer of 2015. That's when the second blue marble, 43 years 43 years, you didn't have a second full disc shot of the Earth. In fact, the first one only showed, didn't show America. You would have thought Americans, you would have shown them. But no, it showed one continent in its, in, I'm sorry, continent, in its entirety, which was Antarctica, of all things, and then the bottom part of Africa. Brilliant, because two birds with one stone. It's like, oh yeah, that's what Antarctica looks like. They went out of their way to do that, but no blue marble shot had been taken. I mean, that's that's most of the 70s, all the 80s, all the 90s. All of 2000, 2010, and halfway to 2015, amazing. Absolutely amazing they could get away. And the reason why they didn't do it is because they were scared to death of faking that. It's better to <clears throat> fake interior shots of different different things like a, like a space station. Sorry, my voice was... No, 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 no problem. That's fine. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. What I want to say is, um, so in that case, then, are there photographs of the actual Earth that you've seen? Are there actual photographs of what it really looks like from above? No, 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 there aren't. Um, as a matter of fact, the if you want to look up a great shot, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, a great shot would be uh, the um, uh, the blue marble. In fact, it's not even the blue marble. It's the Rob Simmons first i i don't know when you got your first iphone but the very first model of the iphone had a blue marble type shot it was a picture of the earth on it <clears throat> the problem was is there were no shots of the earth but you know in fact they had to hire a nasa engineer to photoshop and build one from scratch and he done interviews so yeah i built the whole thing in photoshop in fact he got i don't know why and i'm dying to ask him if i ever run into him because the problem was in the southern hemisphere when you look at that he just used the cloning tool on the clouds just like it was like he, it was just like he had to finish it on a friday and to go to happy hour or something because there were just tons and tons of clone clouds at the bottom and we can see this and then when i went to the to the um the houston space center some years later 
I saw Rob Simmons shot on the wall at this NASA facility. And there was no caption underneath it. I knew exactly what it was. You know, we, we've stared at it many, many times. In fact, I pointed out to the documentary team. I go, look, here's the cloning tool in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, I know exactly who built it. I know what he built it in. And yet NASA's got it sitting here like it's an actual shot of the Earth. And uh, the documentary team wouldn't touch it, wouldn't even comment. I'm like, whatever. So. Interesting. There you go. So, no, there are no shots. There are no, there are high altitude shots of the Earth. Yes but not far enough to where you can actually see the whole earth. There just aren't, which is why, because you can't get that far. You can't get that far. Plus it doesn't look like that. You know, the, um, the, the, this is why the, the blue marble shots between one and two, there was 43 years apart. And I, in fact, I wouldn't even have noticed except that uh, Obama was the one that tweeted the second blue marble shot and Scott Kelly, an astronaut, he was the one that wrote the press release supposedly from the space station. Like, Oh my God. Just, Drove me nuts. By the way, Scott Kelly, the fact that he was in that documentary, miracle. Producers said, we have no idea why he said yes. In fact, we only talked to him for five minutes. He sat down. He delivered exactly. He Apparently, he knew the lines before, you know, even the question was there. And he knew exactly what to say because that was the line that was used in the trailers. Which was that the first time I heard about Flat Earth was when I was in the space station, when I was in space. It's like, it's a brilliant line, which immediately yeah. dis dis discredits. It's like, well, I'm an astronaut. I'm here to tell you it's not flat because I was in space. It's like, whatever. So anyway. I guess um, by the same measure, there's uh, little or no photographs of um, like the Arctic wall and the, the edges of the, the, the Earth plate then, I'm guessing. No, no. Why would there be? I mean, this is this is the best secret, best kept secret in the history of us. You know, this is this is something you don't tell people. And yes, there are secrets that can be hidden. Compartmentalization, that's easy. Um, there's some people who come back and say, no, this is so big that you can't keep it a secret. It's like, no, 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 this is so big, you have to keep it a secret. In fact, this isn't like the Manhattan Project where you're refining uranium and you're building an atomic weapon in secret where you have 100,000 people that really don't know what's going on because they're all just working on their little piece. No, no, this is something where less is better. You just don't tell. You don't want as few people going down there as possible, you know, down to Antarctica. It's only like 5,000 people down there at any given time, most of them military or military scientists. Uh, nobody know, owns Antarctica, which is brilliant. You know, find me another piece of real estate in the world that isn't owned by someone. Uh, if you want to go down there and do your own expedition, you have to apply for a massive amount of, of permits. To, from from multiple countries and by the way by the time you're done doing that they know exactly where you are and the gps system if you're going to use that while you're down there it's going to take you exactly where it wants to take you everything and they've had years and years and years to refine this back in 1960 when they first figured it out it, you know the general public wasn't really exploring stuff the internet wasn't wasn't even close to being built yet there was no social media there were no smartphones uh, you had some limited television newspaper and radio so information moved pretty slow and over the last five six decades they refined their process to where now they've got multiple layers of barriers in your way to stop you from figuring this out there was that um a Norwegian group, I think there was two or three sailors, um, uh, quite a young group, who tried to get to Antarctica. I don't know if you heard about this, about probably about 10 years ago now. Um, and I think that they were, I think they were boarded and arrested and put in jail just for trying to get to Antarctica. Did you hear about that? Yeah, I think it was Jarl Vandehoy. Was that his name, I believe? Something like that. I'm not very really good with uh, Norwegian language, but yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a weird, yeah. It was a weird name. Yeah, because if you don't apply for the permits, you can get in a lot of trouble. It's like, why would you get in a lot of trouble? Um, it's very strict what's down there. And I know some people over the years, including me, you know, said, well, there's an Antarctic Defense Force, but they don't have to. You know, our radar and, and detection abilities, if you, if you see someone even getting close to that thing, you can, you can kind of wave them off. Plus, they've enhanced the treaty over the years. Now you can't even, uh, you can't even, like with boats, you can't do stuff below like the 60th parallel. And back, in, like, and then uh, I think it was the beginning of 2017, they banned drones from Antarctica. It's like, why would you ban drones? And some people's like, well, it's because of the uh, uh, the uh, the natural resource and the environmental issues, right? It's an envir environmental treaty. It's like, no, 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 no. I mean, the the treaty was built before environmentalism was even a, a word. I mean, remember Greenpeace didn't even fire up until the 70s. 
So why would you lock this thing down in the 50s when, you know, when we were all about exploring everything? It's like, uh, just it's good stuff, though. So how big um, and popular is the Flat Earth Theory again? And I know that since the Netflix documentary came out, um, the, your fan base or followers, um, however you want to call them, has grown yeah. exponentially. So um, how big is the movement at the moment? Oh, it's massive. It's absolutely massive. Um, the, the problem, it's, it's a blessing and a curse because 90% of our members are in the closet. I know this because they've a lot of them emailed me. It's like, yeah, I'm totally with you. Yeah, I'm not coming out. I'm not, we're not talking about this. I have talked with um, people in industry. I have talked to celebrities. Talked to also, in fact, uh, Kyrie Irving, as much as he helped us, you know, our big NBA basketball star over here. Yeah. Um, when, he, when he came out about it, uh, it, 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 celebrities, when they come out, they it hurts them because the knee-jerk reaction. Uh, look, I mean, look at the headlines I could send. In fact, maybe I'll post one for you real fast. Hang on. The... Um, in your neck of the woods, I will give you real quick here. Yeah, I understand that it is a UK-based um, flat earth society. Um, I was oh, no, there's, there's a huge UK contingent. Uh, yeah, here's one for you. I'll drop this little newspaper clipping in, in the thing for you, which is uh, Freddie Flintoff, right? Uh, you know, ex-cricket guy. You know, over here, we don't know what cricket oh, yeah. is. We, we just turned it into baseball. The... Uh, <laughs> Cricket is actually way more of an interesting game. Baseball is is just not even tolerable without some um, beer. <laughs> it's just not the. Uh, but Freddie Flatter, he comes out. That's the headline. You know, it's like Freddie Flat Earth. You know, he's the. You know, they anyone gets made fun of. Kyrie Irving. The only reason he came out was because he had already had his championship. He had shoe contracts. He was friends with LeBron James. He was making millions of dollars in his twenties, and he felt he had nothing to lose. Well, you know, trophies, you know, the, the luster starts fading after a while. And he, the, the, you know, the journalists, they're merciless. They don't forget this stuff. They're just going to, they're going to keep hammering on them time and time again. I have talked to celebrities like, yeah, there's no way we're going to do what we saw what happened to Kyrie. Kyrie was made the example of. So there are millions. Absolutely. In fact, here, here's one for you. I'll, I'll show you a real, uh, real cool thing. So you could punch this up on you. I don't know if you have a, a laptop or whatever. You don't need the app for this. Which is, we uh, we we eventually made our own app, and uh, on this app we just launched maybe four weeks ago uh, something called a flat Earth friend finder. So you activate and you can turn on, you know, it's like well flat earthers, you know, friends that are alive in your area, and you punch that up, and you know, I think out of the hundred thousand people that were just on this app, I think twenty five thousand and change, twenty six thousand have turned on their locators. And again, that's just one small app out of all the people. There are millions. Absolutely. Oh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll put that on the blog on our website so anyone listening can can check that out. And yeah, yeah, yeah. zoom in. I mean, the UK, the UK presence is huge. Basically, any English-speaking country uh, were the ones that got into a big. Um, United States, UK, Canada, of course, Australia, New Zealand, uh, a bunch of Europe, not as much in France for some reason. Um, Eastern Bloc countries, very, very cool. I mean, we're we're all over the place. So I guess one final question from me then, Mark, is that if you've got um, only one opportunity to sell your um, your flat earth theory to someone, yeah. what would you say to convince them that your your theory is true? Uh, I would tell them the same thing that how I started with, with the flat earth clues, which was I'm not here to convince you or persuade you. I'm just here to, to pose the question, which is like, don't believe a word I've said and you know, take everything everything you've heard here with a grain of salt. Do your own research and figure it out. We have a 99% retention rate. That's higher than basically any organized religion, as far as I can tell, which is because I'm not the one to convince you. You have to convince yourself. Uh, you know, Do your own research and ask questions. And once you do, if you're the one that tore down the globe yourself, the reason why we have such a high retention rate is how can you, it's kind of like the matrix thing, right? Red pill, blue pill. Once you're out of the matrix, how do you go back in? You can't because you were the one that left voluntarily. Uh, if you abandon the globe and get into the whole snow globey thing, uh, why, why would you ever go back? How could you go back? So, which is why I have to put a warning to anyone that might be listening, which is like, and this is not reverse psychology. It is absolutely not. If you like your way, you know, way it is right now, if you think you got a good beat on things and you wake up every day, you know, thumbs up, everything is awesome. Don't do it. Don't look into flat earth. I'm warning you because once you do, you will, you know, eventually you'll get to this moment where you can't turn back. 
there'll be this moment where it's like, holy crap, you know, you, you've gone too far and you can't go back. And then next thing you know, you'll be emailing me. It's like, you wrecked my life <laughs> and, and in a good way. But at the same time, you, you'll miss some of the other stuff. You know, ignorance is bliss. So there you go. So, Mark, I have to say, I have huge amounts of respect to anyone who fights for what they believe in, um, even when it goes Thanks. against the so-called accepted narrative. I mean, obviously, past scientific pioneers such as Galileo, Albert Einstein, Alan Turing, Mohammed Reza, etc., to name a few, were all persecuted for the, um, the advances in science that they discovered and tried to bring to prominence. So I genuinely applaud you for doing the same. Um, thank you for your time tonight, Mark. Um, Thank for you. those Thank who would like to hear more from uh, Mark Sargent and his Flat Earth Theories, check out his YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Mark K. Sargent. And also be sure to check out his documentary on Netflix, Behind the Curve. It is fantastic. Mark, thanks again for coming on. I'm genuinely so thankful that you spared us the time to, to talk to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.